Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, PayPod listeners? I'm Scott with you again, and get ready because it's time for yet another excellent episode of PayPod, the Payments and Fintech podcast. On this episode, we are turning our attention back to the world of fintech education. We're going to be exploring the what and the why of fintech education while touching on the world of fintech at large. And joining me on the show to help discuss this is Dr. Theodore H.K. Clark. He is the Associate Professor of Information Systems, Business Statistics, and Operations Management Department, ISOM, of the Hong Kong University of Science Technology, or HKUST. He has degrees in engineering, law, business, and IS management, and has taught multiple MBA and MS ISM courses in the past at HKUST. Needless to say, we are so lucky to have someone so knowledgeable as a guest here on the show. Ted, welcome to the show. Thank you. To start us off, you know, I kind of listed off the credentials there, but can you tell us just a little bit more about your career with such a wide range of educational knowledge from engineering to law and business? What ultimately led you to teaching at the Hong Kong University of Science Technology and putting together Coursera courses on fintech? Well, I started off my career as a math major and then decided math got a little too theoretical and I love math, I love calculus, but getting into higher level mathematics was a little less applied or practical than I wanted. And so I shifted to engineering and I love to build things, make things, create things. And I love the mathematical foundations of engineering. Uh, Went out, finished my degree, graduated in the top of my class or in the top 5% and got a good job with IBM doing fun stuff in the engineering. But over time, I began to realize that the finance and marketing people kept all the money (laughs) and the engineers don't get paid as well. Mm -hmm. And I figured I was at least as smart as many of these finance and marketing people who are getting paid more. And so I needed to figure out how to get paid more. And so I applied to Harvard Business School, was admitted, got an MBA there, And that was very good for career. Essentially, that move alone tripled my salary. Wow. And I started thinking this was really good. And then I realized that entrepreneurs make more money than consultants. And so there's even more money out there if you start up a business or do other things. I started investing in startup businesses and doing some things on the side and became more interested in entrepreneurial activities and doing okay with that. But eventually, the side activities plus a career in McKinsey ended up being really hard work and long hours. Mm -hmm. And my wife suggested that she wasn't seeing me very much. During my last year with McKinsey, I spent an average of three days a month in town, 27 days a month on the road. I was living in Atlanta and managing projects in Hong Kong and Mexico. And so I was always on a plane, always with a client, even... When I was in Hong Kong, I would be working in the middle of the night because my clients in Mexico would have something up. Or if I was in Mexico, I'd be up in the middle of the night working with clients in Hong Kong. So always up and going, which was just a lot of fun, but it was not much fun for my wife. Mm -hmm. And she suggested that it might be better for me to find a new career or a new wife. Now, (laughs) as an engineer... Finding a new wife is really hard. Finding a new <laughs> career is not so hard. So of course. that was an easy choice. And so I thought about what do I want to do? And I'd been making good money and investing and doing well with finances. And I decided that I really missed technology. I was doing technology strategy and technology consulting, but I missed the bits and bytes. And so I thought about what I wanted to do with my career. And I realized that one of the things I wanted to do someday was to be a professor. And my dad is a professor. My wife's father's a professor. Uh, Academics is strong in the family. 
many people getting PhDs. And so I decided to go get a PhD. And I applied to Harvard. They said yes. So I went and got a PhD in information systems management, IS, which is sort of applied computer science, mm -hmm. and did that for the next five years. Given my entrepreneurial bent, I wasn't entirely focused on my PhD studies. I also did real estate development and ended up with 67 houses and apartments that I was renovating wow. that I bought during the financial collapse and the late 1980s and early 1990s and made a lot more money in real estate than I ever did being a professor. So, you know, it paid very well and it helped that I had developed a lot of relationships with people that had money so that I could, even though I had no job and no income as a PhD student, I was still quite bankable because of trust. So ended up my degree after five years with quite a bit of debt, uh, properties that were at the time, slightly negative in cash flow, and I was a little worried about income. But I got a job in Hong Kong that paid well, and we were able to pay off the debt within about five years and be debt free and own a lot of real estate. Wow. Which was pretty cool. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was in the finance area, even though I wasn't studying finance, I was doing some aspects of finance and entrepreneurship. Also, over the next five years, did a dot-com startup that failed, uh, did a few other entrepreneurial ventures, some of which succeeded, some of which failed, and made uh, millions of dollars in some ventures, lost over a million in another venture. And so ups and downs, that's the nature but of... That's the entrepreneurial life <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I was able to do that as a professor on the side I would be CFO or CIO of a company that uh, my wife would run, and uh, much to her annoyance, she was once asked, could she be put into a book of CEOs that were women? And she said, don't you ever do that. I never wanted to be CEO. My husband made me do this. <laughs> she, she was actually very good at running companies. Sure. And she said raising six children helped her to be good at running things. So she was a very good manager, very good at details, very good at operations. I was very good at strategy, finance, and IS, uh, mm -hmm. system side. So we had some nice successes and made some decent money uh, so that I didn't really have to worry about money. And being a professor is a lot of fun. It's not necessarily the most lucrative career I could have picked, but it's not a bad life and it gives you a lot of flexibility. As one of the things I did in my spare time as a professor was to take an online law degree from Concord University in Los Angeles. That's a four-year online degree that is a lot of work, mm -hmm. and it was challenging and difficult, but it's an example of an online education. I saved more money in taxes in one year on one real estate deal than I paid in four years for tuition. Wow. One deal more than paid for the value of that law degree education, just from knowing something that I could do, knowing something that was useful. Right. And so I didn't have to practice law as an attorney out with clients. I was my own client and the knowledge itself was valuable. And it's been valuable in a number of ways as a consultant advising startups on legal issues, contract issues. And so law was a hobby, something that I did after I had finished my doctorate. So these are just different backgrounds. There's many things I like to study, like to learn. I had to have 130 credits to get my undergraduate degree. And I think I had 190 before I finished my undergraduate degree, simply because, you know, they didn't seem to count the music credits <laughs> and the, uh, the history credits and the accounting and business mm -hmm. courses for an engineering degree, but they were things I was interested in. So that's a luxury that you often have. Absolutely. So that was a lot of fun. But at any rate, so that's my background is I have a somewhat eclectic background. I also have ADHD, if you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> uh, I get a little bit excited about things and intense, and I tend to get bored fairly easily. Well, absolutely. And it sounds like, you know, you've covered so many different subjects and you've had so many different yeah. projects in your life. I'm curious of just zeroing in on the fintech side of things, because yep. that does really intersect with actually a lot of things when you do talk about business and yeah. law and technology. Sure. So, so I, I want to set the stage for folks listening 
with blockchain, cryptocurrencies, huge leaps forwards in you know mobile and banking technology and payments. There's so much going on in the fintech world. Why is an education in fintech so important and perhaps even necessary for students who may be in areas like business law or technology? Well, I don't think it is. Oh, I don't okay. think you have to study fintech. Sure. I think that it might be useful, but I don't think that it's necessary or essential. Now, having taught multiple courses in fintech, that may be counterproductive to make that argument, but I don't think that you have to take a fintech course to get an MBA or to finish an undergraduate in business or to study law. You could totally ignore this area and you'd be okay in many other fields. However, if you want to work in banking or finance, it is very, very important. And here's why. The head of HR for Standard Charter Bank, a large bank in Hong Kong, came to our university speaking to undergraduate students. And one of the students said, what do you need to do to get a job, to get hired by Standard Charter? This was a finance major who's asking, what do I need to get a, do to get a job in finance? And the head of HR said it would really help if you know Python, R, and analytics. Uh, and it wouldn't hurt if you knew some finance. So this is a finance industry saying, essentially, guys, we got a lot of people that know finance. We don't have enough people that know tech. Mm. So given that we're facing competition from FinTech, given that we're having these challenges, you want to join our team. Don't come in with what we already know how to do well and tell us we need to hire you. We're actually laying off people with those backgrounds. We're getting rid of people. We're hiring more tech people. Goldman Sachs lays off 700 people on Wall Street and hires 1,000 programmers. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're reducing their headcount. It's that they're shifting to technology because they need to automate things. They need to improve things. Now, this isn't unlike other industries. General Motors may lay off people in an assembly line and hire people that know how to design and build robot factories. You know, we're replacing traditional human manual labor of one sort or another with more automation of some sort or another. Right. That's true in retailing. That's true in manufacturing. That's true in finance. But it has, in the past in finance, only been true at the clerical level, we would replace a bank teller with an ATM. Hmm. Okay, we saw that happen. That's FinTech. That's tech applying to finance that automates and improves. But it didn't really affect people graduating from Yale. Right. They said, you know, I'm not going to get a job as a bank teller. What do I care that you're automating away these low paid jobs? That's not my problem. But when you start replacing middle management, a loan officer with an automated loan evaluation and approval system, now their jobs are threatened. Now their careers are threatened. And we see more and more, not just fintech. This applies to many industries. We're seeing a lot of middle management jobs going away and a lot of technology becoming more important. And this is more than just engineering. It's not just building things. It's building new business models, new ideas, things like fintech. Fintech is not a technology and it's not finance. It's the blending of the two. And that is powerful. Just like e-commerce is not marketing and it's not technology. It is the blending of the two. It is making life more convenient, more powerful. And that could be true of payments. It could be true of shopping. It could be true of lending. It could be true of many different aspects of business today. And the skills we need are complicated mm -hmm. because in order to be able to do that new business model, new innovations, you need to be able to understand the existing business, understand consumer needs and understand technological capabilities of some sorts. And so you need to be able to blend business and technology, which is something I do well but it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Right. So if you're a tech person and you're studying computer science, the world does not need another operating system. That's okay. I mean, we're pretty fine with Apple OS and Android and 
Absolutely. Microsoft Windows may <laughs> piss us off from time to time. But, you know, <laughs> from time to time, yes. <laughs> you know, but we really don't need a new Unix. What we do need is a better way to improve operations and integrate in technology into a small business to make it be more productive and make more money or a large business. But I'm just saying the world is filled with small businesses. They need you too. And so if you can apply tech to business, which means you can relate to and understand their business problem and bring in the technological knowledge, that's a powerful combination. And so there's a, there's a, a need for that. And then the academic world, we generally call that combined fit of tech and business information systems. So that's the program that I teach in. I'm the director of the master's program in information systems. I teach in the undergraduate program in that. And it's broadly applying technology to business problems. And that's what I see FinTech is. Now, is it important? Yes. Is it useful? Yes. Do you need to be an expert in everything? Not at all. Even if you're working in fintech, even if you love fintech, you could do fine with an entire career in fintech and never be able to figure out really what a blockchain is. Right. Um, doesn't really matter if you're doing uh, some kinds of loan approval systems or data analytics or high velocity trading. You don't really need that per se. Sure. Uh, wouldn't be bad, would be an okay thing to learn, but you can't necessarily specialize in everything. Um, it's useful to know something. So it's useful to know something of FinTech. When you have students that are, you know, taking your courses or they're in information systems, are there any specific, you know, maybe pain points that they run into, you know, maybe areas that are pretty challenging to grasp or sort of putting it all together, whether it's a specific course or just an idea or maybe an even whole way of just approaching, you know, this vast swath of knowledge that's out there. Do you see any students get stuck in things and how do they kind of navigate them or how do you kind of help them through that? There's kind of two types of significant pain points we encounter. One is a phobia about programming. Mm. And so anything involving programming seems scary. And so when they have to do programming, they may feel intimidated. That's sort of a psychological barrier because most people, when they actually break through and have to do it or suffer through the pain, it's like, I, I'm not real fond of running, but I can do <laughs> running. And after 10 or 15 minutes, I get into the zone and I, I've gone through the pain and I start to feel the joy. And I, you know, I don't really exactly like it, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. There are many things like that. You know, for example, I don't like shots, but I find that a shot hurts for two weeks before I have to get it much more than it does for five minutes after I've gotten it. Right. It's, it's a psychological barrier more than a physical barrier. And so, you know, just don't tell me, just make me do it and make me get over it. And if I look at programming as a tool, like a hammer, and I'm trying to use it to do something, well, I'll figure out how to do it because it's a good tool. So that's fine. But we sometimes make it too academic or too theoretical. And we find it better in classes to design a class with students to say, here's your task. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to figure out how to improve this e-commerce business. And here's a tool you could use. It's called R. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, yeah, yeah, that's better than trying to crunch all these numbers by hand. Ah, and I can do programming in Excel. I call it VBA, but let's not call it a program. Let's just call it automation of Excel to serve you better. And people say, yeah, I can do that. Well, that's sort of baby programming steps. And so people can get into this world of programming and they're not, it's not as big a pain as most people think it is. And it's much less mathematical than people think it is. But that's the other pain point is anything involving mathematics mm -hmm. or statistics sometimes scares people and people may be creative. They may be talented. They may like money. So they may want to get a degree in IS because they like to get paid and the salaries are pretty good but they're afraid of the math. 
and they say, how hard is this? I've heard that engineering is really hard and other things are really hard. And they are. I mean, engineering is a lot of math. And if you can't do well in calculus, you're not going to do well in engineering. You can survive in an IS program. You're probably going to suffer some in the analytics parts. And, you know, you may not want to get a job doing that. But at least you ought to get enough exposure to it to be able to respect it to understand what the needs are, what the tasks are. And so you don't have to be an A student and everything, but it would be helpful to get some analytics background. Absolutely. That's giving me flashbacks to my business education. And we had a statistics course. There were a couple of them that were really considered weed out courses because they were brutal and all the business students had to go through them. But, uh, you know, it's important and no, not everybody needed to get an A, but, but then you have that background and you kind of get through that, right? And they're not weed outs for everybody. For example, <laughs> exactly. I looked in my MBA program and the stats course and the microeconomics course, no problem. But marketing was hard for me because all of this soft, squishy stuff that I can't <laughs> quite figure out how the mathematical models work and what is it you're talking about understanding consumer design. What? <laughs> Where's the stats? Where's the data? Show me the survey. I can work with that. But my worst course as an MBA in my first year of my MBA was marketing. I got so mad about getting a less than a stellar grade in that, that I took five marketing courses in my second year wow. to make up for failing in my first year to prove that I could figure this thing out. I'll show you I know marketing. <laughs> yeah. And I did. I learned there are aspects of marketing that are much easier for me to understand. But to this very day, I do not understand fast moving consumer goods. I don't see why somebody would pay a lot for a high end consumer item. I, it's just not part of my psyche. Mm -hmm. I understand why you'd shop at Walmart. I don't understand why you'd go to Saks Fifth Avenue. Sure. And so I like FinTech partly because we're talking about automating, cost reducing, moving to the mass market. We're doing cool things. And is it elite? Is it the best? No. But we're finding the elite firms like Goldman Sachs bringing out for the first time in their history a online checking account and trading type application that anyone with a hundred US dollars can sign up for right. and get, you know, virtually free stock trading. Well, this is not Goldman Sachs's traditional business model. This is very much FinTech and it's a very different view of the world, which says the masses are starting to matter. Probably make Bernie Sanders proud. The masses are starting to matter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, I think one thing that in fintech, when we talk about these great tools, these great opportunities created by innovation, especially when we talk about blockchain and crypto, and we've had folks on this show that are really into all of that, there's also this regulatory side of things, you know, and that's where you get yeah. into like reg tech. And you've put a course together on that very topic, reg tech. And why is that such a you know, critical area of study. And I'm curious about just your thoughts on regulation because there seems to be this debate, this internal push and pull from a lot of people, specifically some of these Wild West cryptocurrency type things of no regulation. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow things down. You're going to stop innovation versus, hey, maybe you kind of need regulation because that can help bring things to the masses and, and so on. Yeah. I mean, it absolutely will slow things down and it does slow things down. And it's a barrier. And if you're a true believer in all things Bitcoin and Bitcoin should go to the sky, regulation is not your friend. Right. It's not going to help you make this the replacement for central banks and the replacement for fiat currencies. And so regulation is the enemy of many small startup businesses. As the president and chairman of uh, JP Morgan said, Regulation is our biggest ally. It's our biggest friend. So if you're a traditional large banker, regulation is a huge boost or benefit. It's also a pain in the neck and you get fined and you get lots of uh, things apply to you, whether you're Goldman or JP Morgan or Wells Fargo, you're going to face lots of penalties for not complying with some regulation or another. And so at times it's tempted to say, this is our enemy. 
But the aspect of regulation that's very positive for traditional banks, whether they're in fintech or not, is that it has economies of scale. And so there's, I mean, there's just a huge amount of regulations to, to, to avoid a financial collapse of 2008 type proportions. We've put out so many more regulations today than we ever had before that we used to have a regulation that with the regulations of banking used to be of the scale or magnitude of a book. Mm -hmm. You would have to read this book and it would be a thick book, but it would be a book. It wouldn't be more than a thousand pages. Now we're looking at multiple bookshelves full, floor to ceiling of regulations wow. and tombs of knowledge, such that if you were to really study them and try to take a test on them, at the, you would spend a whole year reading everything, be pressured, stressed, and at the end of the year, you'd probably want to start over because things have been rewritten, revised. It's really hard to keep up with it, and so you need a whole department or area and a lot of people are working in regulation and compliance and trying to make sure the bank is following all the rules and that they're safe. Now, having said that, those regulations don't make you money. Mm. They aren't part of your productive output. They're not valuable to customers other than avoiding a financial meltdown, which is valuable indirectly. But it's not going to make you choose one bank versus another. Oh, you got better regulation. You got better, uh, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> compliance. Uh, I'm going to switch over to your bank. Well, maybe you don't like people stealing or committing fraud, and so that might get you to switch. But other than that, it's not a positive incentive. But what it does do is help keep us safe, but at a cost. And so what you want to do if you're a startup is figure out how to focus in on the regulations that matter and how to be more efficient. This is where reg tech is sort of a great equalizer. Mm. It's the small guy's hero is reg tech makes it possible to keep up with that. Because you remember I said you can't read a bookshelf floor to ceiling full of legalese documents and regulations and really stay sane after the end of the year. But a computer can read it in minutes and it can figure out how to help you apply it in your business. And you can program it to say, look for this, look for that. And all of a sudden you replaced a 10,000 person regulatory group with a software application. Now you can be a small business. You can be lean and, and do it. You can be lean and still comply. Mm -hmm. And so that's what reg tech is doing, is helping you to equalize against the big guys. But the big guys are looking at this and saying, uh, do we need these 10,000 people? Right. That helps them too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and so they're looking at this and saying, we really need to make sure we're compliant with regulation. It's not enough to trust this software app because computers make mistakes sometimes. Sure. And so do people, by the way. And so RegTech is there to try and stop people from making mistakes, but they will and they'll commit fraud. They'll, they'll do dumb things and the combination can cost you a lot of money. So banks are looking at software, looking at applications, and this is where the money is going into reg tech from large banks buying reg tech applications. And so if you look at it from an entrepreneur point of view, you probably make more money in reg tech serving traditional financial service industry clients who spend a fortune on technology. And so you could think of reg tech if you were to draw a comparison of fintech and e-commerce, you could think of reg tech as like the B2B side of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. The logistics, the back end, the support that is kind of invisible. You don't see it when you go to Amazon's webpage or Taobao's webpage, but you know, you couldn't have a Taobao or an Amazon without the delivery fulfillment piece of the puzzle without a combination of UPS and FedEx and logistics and automated warehouses, it would be expensive. Mm -hmm. And companies trying to compete with Amazon like Walmart are finding, you know, you just, you have a store and you put a shopper out there and the shopper goes to fulfill your order. That's not actually as low cost as Amazon's warehousing approach. 
Sure. I mean, Walmart is struggling with business models and they're doing okay. It's not like Walmart's a failure, but Amazon is cheaper in their business model and system. Absolutely. And when Amazon is cheaper than you, uh-oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> yep. So, so, so that's true of FinTech as well. So the large firms are looking and saying, we've got to think about how we manage FinTech, RegTech differently in order to reduce our costs. And we can replace those 10,000 people doing paper pushing and regulatory compliance and auditing, maybe not replace all of them, that would be pretty foolish, but replace many of them and hire more people doing tech to be able to implement that across the company. I think that ties perfectly back into what you were saying about, you know, why fintech? Because then that just goes, if you're looking at a career standpoint, a value yeah. standpoint, where are the jobs being added and what what can you bring to the table, right? Right. So if you love regulatory compliance and assurance, figure out how to get a computer to work for you. And you could still do your job, just learn programming as well as the things you've been doing add that into your repertoire. How do you do that? Do you need to go back to college and get another degree? I don't recommend it. If you're 40, 30, 40 years old, don't go back to college to get another degree. Well, maybe. I mean, if you really want to, that's okay. I did, but it doesn't mean you have to. What you can do is take courses on Coursera or Mm -hmm. edX or other platforms or you can take online courses, maybe get an online master's or MBA. I mean, you could go to Georgia Tech and take a master's degree in computer science, all online, keep your day job. And now, you know, compliance, you know, auditing, and you have a CS foundation. Jeez, you know, (laughs) Goldman's going to be looking at you and saying, boy, I'm sure glad we didn't lay you off. Right. Because you know how to do more than anybody else in the compliance and assurance part of your business. But I mean, you don't really need a whole degree. You just need some skills. Right. So you need you to be able can, to speak to it. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. And do something. <laughs> right. Do something to help the company make money, help the company save money. Absolutely. You know, reg tech is a huge thing. One of the big eight, well, they're now big four accounting firms said they used to be big eight when I was young. <laughs> right. <laughs> four of them left, you know, mergers and consolidations and the Enron meltdown that killed uh, Anderson. Mm-hmm. But one of the big four consulting firms made the statement, RegTech is the new FinTech. And you might look and say, no, 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 FinTech is bigger than RegTech. That's obvious. But what he was effectively saying is the number of startups in RegTech is bigger than the number of startups in FinTech. So if you look at the opportunities, where can you make money? Where can you be small business? Look at RegTech like you would IT outsourcing or cloud computing. It's that kind of area of opportunity, that which powered India's growth and outsourcing right. is powering innovative startups in reg tech, figuring out a way to do something for a large client who has money and can pay your bills. <laughs> exactly. You know, now it's okay to be on the front end side of e-commerce or fintech and to go out and find clients. But it's also okay to let Amazon do that and be an Amazon partner and let Amazon do the front end retailing and you figure out how to be better in the supply chain and better at putting things up on Amazon and let Amazon worry about what they do with Google AdWords or other things. Right. And then eventually, you know, maybe you're helping someone out and they turn around and say, you know what, we want to acquire you and pull and bring yeah. you in. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then you've got your cool. exit. You've got some exciting things going on. You know, there's all these opportunities that way. Google has a great maps business, but they found that the best map company in the world was in Israel. They bought them. Mm-hmm. And so they integrated them in. <laughs> a small, specialized expertise is something Google says, man. We really like this. And many small startups, their path to exit is getting bought out by a larger corporation, which is fine. I mean, it's it's nice profits. Ted, I know we are short on time here, so I want to end with one of the fast five questions that we usually do. I want to ask this one because you have had such a tremendous amount of experience. What is the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? The best business advice in my life has been from a fellow investor, angel investor, VC investor, who said, never 
go into a business venture if you're the only one that believes in it. If you can't persuade other smart people that this is a good idea. And I don't mean getting followers who will follow you along. You can always find other investors who will put money on. Sure. Family, sure. friends, people who trust you. But I mean people that you look at and say, this guy's as smart as I am and he likes it too. If you can find two other people like that as an investor, this business may work. Now you still are probably 70, 80% likely to fail. So that's life. You're going to make mistakes, but you're almost certain to fail if you can't get smart people to buy off on the idea. And if you're an entrepreneur and you can't get smart investors, you can only get stupid investors, get out, quit. Another related piece of smart advice is have a kill switch in your mind when you say enough is enough and when you're going to exit, because the tendency is to keep thinking another 50K, another six months, we'll turn this around. We've had negative cash flow for two years, but we're really close. You can be really close for a decade and still be losing money. And most businesses fail sooner than that because they run out of people willing to back them. But just have a point in mind when you admit that you are not going to be successful in this venture. So that's true of many things. It's true of fintech apps. It's true of IT projects. Some of the biggest notable failures were when companies said, no, if we keep putting more money into this, eventually we'll work. No, it won't. Five years, you've wasted a billion US dollars and you're going down. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Kill it much earlier. So look for why this doesn't have the support you think it should. And what does that tell you? And think about when do you throw in the towel and say, it's time to move on and try something else. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It means the idea did not work as well as you had hoped. Um, so that would be my best business advice. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of folks who are listening here and you know, maybe they have ideas they're working on that aren't working out so much or they want to start something new, definitely keep that in mind. Ted, yes. I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today. Really just a, a fantastic exploration of fintech at large, but also the educational aspect of it and, and why it can be such a benefit to study these things. So thank you. Well, one last plug, study something. Yeah. Keep learning. <laughs> Keep moving on. I almost don't care what. Some things may not even be that useful, but, you know, studying history can at least make you a more interesting person and make <laughs> right? you appreciate other people more. So study almost anything you find interesting, helpful, or useful, but keep improving your mind. That's awesome. Thank you again so much, Ted. Okay. You're welcome. Take care. Well, that's it for our show today. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what we do here, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening platform is. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. Soar.